Thank you, Prime Minister. We, uh, we have a real treat for you this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We wanted to uh, take this beyond just a, a speech from the Prime Minister, but also to sit down and hear some of her views on mental illness more broadly. And uh, the treat for you is that uh, we've been able to coax out of retirement Australia's greatest and best interviewer, Andrew Denton. <laughs> Prime Minister, may I call you Julia in the informality yes, of, of the day? Of course. Thank if you I very can much. call you Andrew. You can call me Andrew, please right. do. Or Big A, as some people do. Oh, right. <laughs> um, I, I, in the spirit of honesty and the honesty that John's uh, shown today, I'd like us to have an open conversation. Now, I understand that as a politician and as Prime Minister, that can be tricky sometimes. So I'm going to ask the audience to assist, if you could, if the Prime Minister inadvertently lapses into a moving forward moment. <laughs> could you just tap your glasses lightly? <laughs> so if we could rehearse that now so we're all ready. If you could, Prime Minister, just give us a quick moving forward. Uh, moving forward. Very good. <laughs> we're all ready to go. Now. Right. <laughs> now what I'd like to do this afternoon is talk a, a bit about the job you've taken, uh, talk a bit about your uh, upbringing with your father, and then about your workplace leading us to mental health. The first thing I want to ask you is, are you okay? Because I noticed the slight panic in your face when you heard that Rob Oakshot wasn't here because <laughs> you need to have him within sight at all times. <laughs> um, I'm fine, thank you, Andrew. Very good. Uh, but I do wonder whether this will be the first test of Tony Abbott's generosity with our new pairing arrangements <laughs> <laughs> next it, week. It may well be. <laughs> We'll leave Tony Abbott out of it, uh, your, your former sparring partner in health, of course. Of course, yes, for many years. Your new job, when did you get used to being called Prime Minister? Oh, at, well, not even yet in some ways. Mm -hmm. uh, I sometimes, uh, you know, have the radio on and they say the Deputy Prime Minister's doing this, that or the other thing and I think, no, I'm not, and then I realise they're talking <laughs> about Wayne. Uh, so, yes, yeah, still taking me a little bit of a while to get used to. Uh, but I'm not worried about it because I've had the example of Steve Brax, who's a great friend of mine, who for quite a long period of time you would be calling out to him, Premier, Premier, and when you didn't get any response, you'd have to bellow, Braxy, and finally he'd <laughs> turn round. So I think I'm still in that zone. Same in New South Wales, only they know they're not going to be Premier much longer. <laughs> I remember when you we first took the job and the, uh, the Daily Telegraph or News Limited uh, did a photo essay on you and there was a photograph of you sitting in uh, the uh, Prime Ministerial plane uh, reading, I think, Barack Obama's Race of a Lifetime. What is that moment like when you, you, you brief it yourself but you're in, yes, it's the taxpayers, but effectively your plane? Right. Oh, well, <laughs> I had been on what we call the, you know, VIP flights mm. before, so that wasn't entirely new to me. Yes, but uh, you, can, you can order this to land in Altona. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not quite. I, I could possibly order it to land at Avalon or right. uh, maybe if we did the tarmac again at yeah. Point Cook, but yeah. not really at the beach in Altona or but anything you, like you that. But you could have buzzed Tony Abbott's house. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's true, and of course Tony had a camp, uh, plane during the campaign, so he could have come to Altona and done a few circles. Yes. Uh, but with that photo, I was uh, genuinely reading that book. Uh, John Faulkner was on the plane with me. I think he was next to me in that photo. And I think uh, the best, for those of you who haven't read it, it's a fantastic book, and perhaps the best moment in it uh, is where they record a conversation between President Obama and now, of course, Vice President Joe Biden, where Joe Biden turns to him and says, as news reports are coming in, who's Sarah Palin? Um, <laughs> only to find out during they the did. course of the campaign. A moment that struck me in that book was also about Sarah Palin when she was preparing for the vice presidential debate and she'd burst onto the national stage and, and she was a celebrity all of a sudden. And uh, then some things went badly in the press for her and she was... Uh, there with her team, her briefing team, and she had piles of palm cards. Yes. And she uh, went kind of catatonic on them, so much so that, in fact, some of her senior staff rang 
uh, uh, John McCain's office and said, we might need some psychiatric help. And uh, they were genuinely concerned for mm -hmm. her and for her ability to handle the pressure. Whenever I talk to politicians, and as I watch the campaign unfold for all of you, I wonder about the, the kind of pressure you're under. When you get up in the morning, what is it you do? Because I know if I'm under pressure, I don't tend to sleep that well and whatever's been troubling me, uh, a lack of a Logie, something important <laughs> like that, uh, that's, it, that's on my mind. You have, you, your entire uh, professional career is based on arguing a case and winning or losing that argument. So when you get up in the morning, how do you clear the decks mentally? Well, fortunately, I'm a pretty good sleeper, so uh, that helps. Uh, so I do tend to sleep well, and I often find if you've uh, gone to sleep with a problem, you wake up the next morning and somehow the answer has um, you know, burrowed its way from the back of your mind into the front of your mind, which is a good thing. Uh, but the um, campaigning, it's kind of hard to explain, and now, uh, looking back on it, it's all fairly much a blur, but I think possibly athlete style, um, you need to keep yourself in that moment. You actually can't afford uh, to uh, think about what has been, think about what's to come, speculate to yourself, uh, will I win, will I lose, what will, I happen if, what will happen if I do win, what will happen if I do lose. You've got to be in that moment and do that task for the day. So. Um, which, you know, announcing a new policy, press conference, several events, all of that kind of thing, uh, and, and just really hone in on it. So um, it's a different way of living than uh, you would normally. And there's also a physicality to it, which is you're um, on the road for five weeks, um, you know, crisscrossing the country. Uh, I lost count of the air miles we did, but, you know, tens of thousands. Uh, very rarely sleeping in the same place two nights in a row, so just the physicality of loading in every night, loading out every morning, so um, that is also different to the, you know, I mean, we are frequently on the road, but not like that uh, at any other time. So I assume you have an awesome collection of shower caps and little soaps for <laughs> Uh, you know, you get to the stage where you think it's just not worth taking them anymore, <laughs> Andrew. <laughs> you have travelled a lot. I have travelled a lot. <laughs> In your professional life, has there been a time, and when has that time been, that you felt so under pressure that you were finding it difficult to function as you normally would? Look, in, in my professional life, um, there have obviously been times of, um, you know, uh, pressure. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say there's been a time where uh, I thought, you know, I'm not functioning as I should, but there are times when you're, you know, acutely aware of the pressure, the, you know, blockbuster speeches in Parliament under pressure where, you know, you can kind of uh, hear your heartbeat as you're uh, engaged in the process because, uh, there's a physicality to that too, to the um, sort of uh, uh, carry on in, in Parliament. I mean, it is a combination between politics and theatre and so it does have a, a physicality that you have to get used to. Uh, but, but I'm sort of, you know, for myself and for my colleagues, I think we've probably uh, learned a little bit about looking out for each other. Um, and, and done it the hard way because we've seen people suffer so much because of um, this life and the pressures it has. Now, I don't want to, you know, overput that because we are not the only people under pressure. Uh, the difference for us, I think, is um, that, you know, like for, uh, for you and people in uh, the creative arts, uh, often it's so much in front of the glare of public attention rather than privately. I don't want to overemphasise your workplace either, but it is unique. Um, I want to read you something that Greg Barnes wrote. Uh, you would know Greg. He yes. used to be uh, a staffer with uh, John Fay. Yes. And uh, this was after Nick Sherry mm. uh, attempted to take his own life. And this was his description of, of Parliament. Canberra's Parliament House is one of the most destructive working environments in Australia. It's brutal and unrelenting work environment. It warps people's judgment. Issues and information that bear little or no consequence to reality suddenly become important. The media, staff members and politicians feed off this poisonous atmosphere in a building that contains some fine art and architecture, but
but no soul and warmth. Mm. Does that resonate with you? Uh, look, it, it does a bit. Not, not. Uh, I wouldn't put it as harshly as Greg has, but one of the things I would say about the current Parliament House, um, I, I was obviously never in Parliament in the old Parliament House, but I've heard all the tales from all the, uh, uh, you know, uh, Labor tribal elders about uh, people being you know, sort of cheek to jowl and five people in an office and, uh, you know, you couldn't even... You're sharing a desk and you couldn't even find somewhere to put your stuff down. And, and Gough so Whitlam sculling a jug of vodka every day. <laughs> oh, we've all heard that. Um, so people would gravitate to the public areas, you know, the, the bar, the coffee shops, those kind of things to, to sit. Um, now, obviously, that's not a great workplace, uh, but I think the current Parliament House tends to be at the other extreme, which is it is not a building on human scale. Um, it's a national monument and deliberately designed as much and a very impressive one. Uh, but it, it also means for someone who um, is feeling a bit isolated, uh, it would be physically possible in Parliament House for no one to realise someone was missing um, uh, unless they missed a crucial division or something like that, and then everybody would be saying, oh, have you seen whoever in the last day or two? Um, like it is, and people would think, oh, well, that would never happen because politicians by instinct are gregarious creatures, and so they'd always be going and seeking another human being to lobby and persuade about something. Um, <laughs> but, uh, it, 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 you know, that's not true. I mean, it's true of many politicians, but it's not necessarily true of all politicians, and so it would be possible for someone to very much be alone in that building. Um, I think we understand that about it, and both, um, uh, you know, both sides of politics and indeed across politics, there are deliberately things that have been created to include people at a human level, whether it's playing, um, you know, soccer in the morning or, um, you know, working as uh, Chris Bowen did with Julie Bishop in a friendship groups, you know, about Lifeline and it brings people together, what can we do to help, um, having little meetings and stuff like that. So you get some of that human interaction rather than just the conflict interaction. You mentioned isolation. Nick Sherry, after his suicide attempt, when he spoke about it, because uh, he was part of the senior Labor leadership group at the time, talked about his uh, intense sense of isolation. And after that event, uh, Kim Beasley, then leader of the, the opposition, instituted counselling for the Labor Party. Is, does that still exist? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, it's, uh, the, the political parties have some structures and indeed Parliament itself has some structures. Uh, and so it is possible for uh, someone to get uh, telephone counselling or face-to-face -face counselling and for that to be uh, kept confidential and private but for the costs to be met so that people don't need to worry about that. Um, and I think we also uh, have, you know, from Nick's experience, there is um, more uh, dialogue behind the scenes um, between the political parties than you might imagine. Uh, I think this, you know, there, there still is overwhelmingly a kind of um, sense that if the pressure's on, you've got to show that you're able to take it. Um, but there is now, too, a sort of a channel between the political parties to indicate that, um, you know, maybe someone's not really taking it, um, no matter how much front they're putting on in question time, and uh, people have to consider uh, how they're going to go so from So what there. happens then? Is, is, uh, is there a... Uh, an agreement, are there a group of people w within uh, the, the parties that get together and discuss that the, individual and uh, how, how it's to be handled? Yeah, there, there's a lot of liaison between um, obviously the party whips um, uh, and, and at other levels to, you know, discuss some of those things. So I think that's good that there's been a recognition. Not, not you know, I'm not going to try and pretend it's um, uh, perfect. I mean, overwhelmingly the mm -hmm. dominant culture is that um, you've got a you know, show you can take it. Um, so that is still there, but at least we've recognised that bit that we've seen people who mm. suffered like Nick, um, like Greg Wilton, uh, one of our Labor MPs who did commit suicide, and um, that, you know, people need to show some care and concern and have some understanding. So when Andrew Robb, who is a senior opposition figure, uh, stepped aside due to depression, publicly declared, how, from your point of view, did you see that humanly handled or politically handled? Oh, no, I saw it humanly handled. And, um, I mean, I, I thought it was um, 
uh, you know, a real uh, credit uh, to Andrew that he felt um, that he did and he felt he could um, publicly disclose exactly um, why he was taking that step back from the shadow ministry um, and that he's talked publicly about uh, his experience with depression and uh, his uh, finally seeking treatment and how that treatment came about. I thought that was a very brave step. I thought that helped add to our understanding. Uh, obviously, uh, John Brogdon acting as an advocate publicly has added to our understanding. Uh, Jeff Gallup saying that he was taking a step away from a, such a leadership level of politics because of a battle with depression. I think that's added to our, our understanding and I think you know, whatever political party people are in, everybody looks at those things with a great deal of admiration. John's just given me the wind up, but I do want to ask uh, one thing personally. Your, your father was a psychiatric nurse, John. When did you become first aware of his world, what it actually was? Uh, yeah, my father was a psychiatric nurse at Glenside Psychiatric Hospital in South Australia. Um, he literally, you know, we're migrants, as everybody would know by now. Um, uh, he. <laughs> Uh, he, Both people, yeah. yeah quite a, he, <laughs> <laughs> he literally uh, responded to an advertisement in the newspaper that said, uh, would, you, would you like to be a prison guard or a psychiatric nurse? If so, you know, apply here. Um, and they were looking for, they were deliberately looking for male psychiatric nurses. And he decided he'd rather be a psychiatric nurse than a prison guard. Um, so he uh, did uh, have to do three years of training and Glenside Psychiatric Hospital at that time was an incredibly structured, regimented place. Um, Dad would go to work in a uniform, which was a, a you know, grey business suit, um, a, a white shirt and a tie, and the colour of the tie would designate how senior a nurse you were. So every year there was this very ceremonial, you know, putting on of the new tie to show that he'd gone a year up. Uh, and we would go um, to join him, um, you know, they would have ward parties at, at Glenside, you know, Christmas, that kind of stuff. Uh, many of the people who uh, lived there were actually um, uh, uh, children and adults with Down syndrome, uh, people who would not be in uh, residential uh, care in that sense, in, in our understanding of our world today, but mm. in those days were. Uh, and so, you know, you would literally be, um, you know, I would be at a ward party and I would be playing with a, um, you know, a, a woman who was uh, in her 40s, but due to an intellectual disability would, um, you know, be happy to play childlike games with me when I was young. Uh, so, yeah, we were sort of, you know, very familiar with it. Uh, but the thing, looking back on it now, that is truly remarkable to me is how much it changed in the time mm. my father was there because they're my memories as a young person of the suit and the tie and the regimented nature of the workplace. By the time as an, a young adult I was driving the car in to go and pick Dad up from work, um, Dad would be at work wearing jeans and a T-shirt, you'd walk into the ward where he was working, there would be nothing that would tell you who was a patient, who was a doctor, who was a nurse, um, everybody just in casual clothes and it, the model of care had completely changed mm. and so through the prism of his world I had a real insight into how our you know, perceptions about how we deal with mental illness have so much changed during my lifetime. Final question Julia. The I think the statistic is every day seven Australians commit suicide. We're uh, number four for men, number six for women in the world. Why is it, do you think, that we have such an issue in Australia with this? Well, I'd like to say uh, I'm a big expert in all the causes. I'm not. I think uh, perhaps um, it would be for men in this country, I think for men generally, but maybe particularly in our culture, there is a... Uh, sense that it's not um, uh, masculine to uh, talk about yourself. Uh, it's not, you know, to acknowledge that you need uh, assistance. I suspect uh, our culture still has that quite strongly. Uh, and I think being such, you know, a large country uh, in many regional and rural areas, we've not got the services right. So even if people put their hand up and say, I need some help, it can be hard for them to get the help they need. Uh, and obviously with our young people and coming from Melbourne, we've seen in some of our schools um, some really troubling things with 
uh, bullying and suicide and copycat behaviour, uh, there's a set of issues there for us to, to think about and work with young people on. Um, and so all of that, you know, kind of lies before us as a community. Uh, but in the meantime, um, you know, there's obviously uh, the services of Lifeline and I'm glad we've been able to help so that, you know, just the physical cost of making the mobile call, we would never want someone to not pick up the phone because they were worried that they're racking up a mobile bill. So I think that's a big big shift, a it's good change. Excellent you're here today and uh, thank you on behalf of everyone. I do know that uh, last night was your first night at uh, uh, Kirribilli House. That's right. Did you jump on the beds? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no we didn't. Um, uh, D Tim, Tim this morning had a fight with the coffee machine and the, <laughs> the, uh, the coffee machine may have won round one, but we'll, uh, we'll keep working on it. <laughs> Front page of tomorrow's telly, I'm quite sure. <laughs> Prime Minister, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.